Okay, so there's another typographer um, who goes by the name Jonathan Cuervo Cisneros, and he re redesigns and updates old fonts as well. Um, he came up with the new font Fibril, um, and it's based on black letter typefaces that were found on documents from um, colonial Latin America. Uh, letters back, so he slanted the letters backwards and he added frilly details to the capitals, and he created these digitally. Um, so I'll change the slide here. Here, this is some historical. I just grabbed these myself, but you can see what um, black letter typefaces look like. These might not actually be from the actual documents from Latin America, but they're still Latin. Um, Latin. I think they are made in. I think this is Latin, but they they still are black letter typefaces. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting to see what they look like. Um, and so this is his font, and as you can see, there there are similarities. Um, between the two fonts and he made this in 2014 and he sells all of his fonts on his website. I would say about this font, um, it's not very legible, it's hard to read, but if he's just trying to recreate black letter typefaces, he's done a good job because you could hardly read the black letters either. I mean, you can hardly tell what each one of these letters is. So I think he's just following suit. Um, so we're going to move on to logos. Um, a logo is an identifying mark or trademark based on letter forms combi combined with pictorial elements. They're supposed to be distinctive and memorable in appearance. Um, and they're often graphic marks, emblems, or symbols that are used to identify a company, organization, product, or brand. Um, and they might take form of an abstract or figurative design, or they might be a stylized version of the company's name. Um, so if you guys have seen the Coca-Cola logo, it's just a stylized um, version of their name, basically just letters. So we're actually going to take a look at um, the Sovereign Bank logo and the Colonial Bank logo. Uh, they carry different messages. And the artist group Superflex was able to appropriate these logos and they took away the typography that was included with the logos. And it really does help to examine the actual marks um, of a logo um, or pic the pictorial element, if you want to call it that, of the logo. By taking away that typography, it really makes, it, makes us able to really take a good, good look at them and what kind of symbolism, symbolism they uh, contain within them. So um, the Sovereign Bank logo, it is basically kind of a, a, tr a traditional looking lantern that sheds light. Um, it's not very modern looking really. It's prim and traditional, and um, but that's kind of what most banks are to most people. I mean, most people imagine them to be pretty prim and traditional. Um, the logo for the Colonial Bank is based on the letter C, which actually can be kind of hard to, to point out, but I guess you can maybe imagine a C here. Um, and then within that, it kind of has this eagle graphic um, inside of it. And the eagle looks kind of strong and fierce, and it's kind of standing guard, peering off into the distance. It looks rather vigilant. Um, which are kind of all things that people hope for in a bank or in a banker, um, somebody that's strong and vigilant and on guard, and it's kind of reassuring, I guess, for people. Um, and the color blue is kind of indicative of a clear sky or good weather, which, you know, is a positive association. Um, so this, the message of these two logos couldn't prevent the two banks from failing during the mortgage crisis of 2008. So both of these banks failed, and that actually allowed the artist group Superflex to uh, appropriate these logos and turn them to, into artwork on banner. Okay, so I had some sort of weird technical difficulty there, but I'll just back up. So we're going to move on to um, posters and other graphics from the logo. Um, and a poster combines um, type and images in a way to give the viewer information um, and it'll attract attention from a distance and at the same time it's able to provide um, or 
or convey a message to the viewer. And it's usually for a specific purpose, such as advertising an event. And um, the concept of a modern poster is over 100 years old. So in the 1800s, lithographs were typically used to make posters. Um, it was a pretty booming industry during the 1800s. Um, Henri de Telouis Lautrec was probably the most important poster designer of this time, and he used lithog lithography to create his posters. We actually talked about him a little bit um, in chapter eight, I believe, with printmaking, because he used lithography, which is the use of sandstone blocks. You use a greasy, um, a greasy crayon to draw on it, and then you ink that up, and the ink sticks to the grease, and then you use that um, to create your print. And if you used in mul multiple colors, you'd use multiple stones. Um, but since lithography kind of ended up um, being taken over in the 20s and 30s, um, they came up with better advances in technology and they were able to do more mass printing with higher quality production. And they were actually able to print photographs as well at this time. Um, so with posters, um, you know, social issues can be really easily expressed. Um, the Black Panther Party was an African-American activist organization that was really active in the 60s and 70s, and they used poster designs quite a bit to try to express social issues um, having to do with, you know, um, African-American um, basic civil, civil rights at that time. Um, and then we'll also talk about the Chicano movement a little bit, not much. Um, and then also the Black Panther, or not, sorry, the Guerrilla Girls um, of the 1980s. So here's some examples of the Black Panther Party um, poster designs. Um, as you can see, they each feature a prominent African American in them. Um, one's a woman, this one's a man, here's a child. Um, power to the people, power and equality, an image of a really strong black woman, totally symmetrical design. Um, and then here's one for President Cleaver. They wanted him to become president. Of course, the first black president didn't, come, didn't happen until President Obama, but um, they wanted to vote the, him into power back in the either the 60s or the 70s. I'm not quite sure what year that's from. Uh, these are just examples that I threw in. And then this says, we shall overcome without a doubt. And then here's the, you know, basically their future, these children um, portrayed in this art, um, in this art poster here. Um, and then here's the Chicano movement poster examples. I just wanted to show some of those. It's basically uh, Mexican-Americans wanted to be, wanted better civil rights at, in the 60s and 70s, kind of the same time as um, the Black Panther Party. And so here's just some quick examples. Um, so this one in the middle says, I am somebody, together we are strong, um, done in, you know, mainly primary colors. Um, I think this might be Che Guevara, um, who was a popular in Latin America. Um, you are not a minority. And then this is actually a poster that's kind of um, advertising a rally that starts at 10 a.m. Um, so anyway, just a couple quick examples from the Chicano movement. And here's that Guerrilla Girls uh, Metro Metropolitan Museum poster from 1989. And this is actually a poster created by the Guerrilla Girls in the 1980s. And they were also um, active in the 90s as well. And it's basically a nude figure from a famous 19th century painting. And they took that and then they added an oversized gorilla mask to her head. And it's basically the same type of headgear the Gorilla Girls would wear when they made public appearances. Um, and they used a sans serif font on a white or a yellow background, which really kind of pops out at you. And then that pink color also helps to pop out of you. And the Gorilla Girls actually put these posters up at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and then in other places in New York, especially where there were art galleries, because they really wanted to draw attention to the fact that um, women really weren't being represented in the art world. I mean, if we read this, it says less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Um, so they just, these women, these women, the Gorilla Girls, did not feel like women were being represented in the art world. Um, 
So we're going to talk about um, Chaz Davies, um, Mavian Davies, Chaz Mavian Davies. Um, he makes posters for internet and street use, and he often works without commission. And he kind of creates pieces that are more um, self-expression. And he also wants to inform and arouse public awareness on important issues. Um, so in this piece, um, it's basically a recent poster design on the refugee problem, and it uses negative space to suggest the worldwide nature of the problem. Um, and the type just kind of reminds us that, you know, it's a human right to seek asylum. So seeking asylum is a human right. And then as we can see, um, he's using a chain link fence as part of the design, um, which is definitely, you know, are we keeping these people out? You know, if we're keeping them out, a lot of times a chain link fence is kind of a symbolism of, you know, locking people away either in the prison system or just keeping people out of a certain area. Um, he also has, you know, the A is in the form of this, um, tool that would actually be used to cut through the chain link fence. Um, and as you can see, the continents are here in, in, the, in the negative space. Um, and then just black, white, and red are used as a color scheme. And it's a pretty serious color scheme, probably because it's a serious subject. Um, and he distributed this poster electronically to his mailing list, and then he sold the paper version on his website for a nonprofit price. Um, so yeah. Pretty neat piece. Chaz Mavian Davies seeking asylum as a human right, 2016, and this is a um, this is a poster. Let me check and see how much time I have on this video really quickly. Can't see it when I'm in presentation mode for some reason. Okay, I still have a few. So Portlandia, um, I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's pretty funny. It's on IFC, and it has. Um, I can't remember the actors now, but anyway, they're funny. Um, here we go. So, oh, I think his name is Fred Armisen. I can't remember what her name is, but anyways, this is a cold open poster for Portlandia. It's from 2015 and probably designed um, by the Broadway video group. Um, and it's a pretty humorous show. Um, and there is a, hum a humorous element to this design. Um, although it is rather subtle, you'd have to know the show to realize. Uh, that it's kind of a humorous design, but it, it basically shows um, these two stars of the show who are basically urban hipsters. And they're posing stiffly next to cliches that refer to the northwestern city of Portland. So Portland's kind of thought of as like this lumberjack town. Um, and the backdrop is obviously painted on the wall. And we can see um, the window frame here behind Fred. Um, and it makes the format of this poster makes it appropriate for both outdoor and magazine use. And if we divide this uh, canvas up into vertical rule of thirds, you can see um, put a line here vertically down the canvas, put a line here down the canvas. There is a rule of thirds that's being um, obeyed. So Fred is kind of within the first. Uh, one of the sections of the rule of thirds, she's kind of in the middle section of the rule of third, and then the th this tree kind of takes up a lot of the, the last section of the painting. Um, and then this orange graphic that says Portlandia is actually kind of on the rule of thirds horizontally anyway, so it would be here and probably here would be if we were to divide that up horizontally in the rule of thirds. So they're using the rule of thirds quite a bit with this piece. Um, and the line from the tree is kind of helping to lead the eye down, and then the line from the legs actually helps you lead the eye up. And then we might actually come up to their eyes and then come back around to this Portlandia text. So that, that might be kind of how your, how your eye ends up somewhat following around these different elements within this composition. Um, okay, so what's next? We might be out of time for this one. I think I'm going to call it good for this for this recording. <laughs>